I'm just pressing record. Yep. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Thank you for being here. Um, this is the the last. Everybody's um, well, the last, of the last of the morning, so this is the penultimate talk, of course, and uh, it's been a great journey so far, um, and uh, yeah, but it's going to be, this, this chapter 21 is a big chapter, so um, I'm not quite sure how long it's going to take. I did think about uh, making this uh, the chapter for the whole morning, but I just couldn't face dragging the, the everything on really for another couple of months really I thought no this this needs to this needs to end really and we need to get there so yeah so there we are so let me just uh, start screen sharing um can I screen share yeah I can can't I here we go screen share that's it share slideshow from beginning right okay does this work it does right okay so i hope you're all seeing that uh, that screen up there so chapter 21 we've come through as it were the dark hole of the tribulation we've uh, gone now past the millennium and we are now in the eternal state so this is what we have to look forward to it's a complex chapter it's a it's a huge chapter in, in every way and i'll do my best to to unpack it so let's move straight in so this could be quite a, a long session i'm not quite sure how long but fairly long i think so verse one now i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away also there was no more sea the description of the eternal state, the new Jerusalem, actually continues right down to chapter 22, verse 5. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a lengthy description. John starts in a very characteristic way. He says, now I saw, and that's the way, John's way of introducing a new section, a kind of a new picture, if you like, of the, the revelation. It's a new heaven and a new earth. And the Greek scholars tell me that that's new in kind, not just chronologically new. God isn't rebuilding, recreating, remaking. This is entirely new. That's what they get from the Greek of this, because the first has passed away, just as Peter says in 2 Peter 3.12. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, there's an interesting thought, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. So that certainly suggests, let's go back to Revelation 21.1, that suggests that, that the old is going to be passed away completely. There's no description of what the new earth is going to be like other than one small sentence he doesn't he describes the new jerusalem he doesn't describe the new the new earth but just this one sentence and this one sentence contains an extraordinary amount of information when we think about it which is this also there was no more sea it's important not to confuse the picture of this new earth and the new Jerusalem with the millennium, as some people do. This is an entirely new creation. It's not a regeneration. You remember Jesus talks in Matthew 19 about the regeneration. He says you shall sit on thrones in the regeneration. And that's talking about the millennium. That is a regeneration of the earth. But this is completely new. Here the earth will be absolutely perfect in fire, but it will be pretty good in, in the millennium. But in the millennium, we know that there is a temple. We know 
that there is sin, because quite obviously there's a rebellion at the end of the millennium. So sin is not fully dealt with. And we know also that there will be death. It will be probably pretty rare, but nevertheless, it will be it will exist. So you have sin, death and the temple here in the eternal state. You don't have any of those things. Well, we uh, you don't have a temple. As, you, you do have God as the temple, but we'll talk about le that later on. So those those things are missed. Those things are not in the eternal state. Now, the fact that there's no more sea is really intriguing because it shows us, tells us that the water cycle, the hydrological cycle, is no longer in existence. And of course, our present Earth gets all its um, life from that cycle. If there isn't rain, there isn't water, life just is not sustained. And you know, the whole thing just stops. So when it says there was no more sea, that's the one clue that there is to how this new earth will be. It will be completely different. It will be sustained in a completely different way. This is hugely new, totally, totally different. We have a new heaven as well. This should not be thought of as the dwelling place of God, but rather the, the universe, the stars, the cosmos, if you like. Most scholars don't think this extends to the, the, the very throne room of God, as it were, because that is absolutely eternal. It never needs to be made new, but God will dwell with us. But that's that more on that to come. So. So many people are worked up today, aren't they, about the future of the Earth and what's going to happen and global warming and all the rest of it. But we can rest completely in this, that it, it is going to be made new. So moving on then. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. John's impressed with the new heaven and the new earth, but his attention is caught by another sight. More amazing still, for he sees the holy city coming down out of heaven. And that's in the present tense. So he's, he's actually witnessing this. He's standing and he's watching the new Jerusalem come down out of heaven. So I think perhaps we could say at this point, uh, heaven does indeed come to earth, but not the earth that we know. Prepared means having been prepared, having been prepared. And this leads many to think that the, the city has been in heaven for some time. And this fits in quite nicely with the words of the Lord himself, where he says in, in the Gospel of John, I go to prepare a place for you. So many think that the city will be ready for the church to dwell in earlier than this moment, because it doesn't say the new Jerusalem is being created at this point. It just says it's coming down out of heaven, which is suggestive that it's already existed in heaven. And let me just read a quote from a chap by the name of Hampton Keithy III. God bless the Americans. Eh? The indication in John 14, 3 is that when Christ would come for his bride, the church, this place would at that time be prepared as a dwelling place. This teaches us that the new Jerusalem is prepared during the church age as a place for the bride and will be in existence at the rapture during the tribulation and the millennium. It will be the home of the church and our eternal abode there begins right after Christ comes for his bride. The author of Hebrews speaks of the heavenly Jerusalem as the abode and hope of the saints. That's Hebrews 12. Some suggest that because this is described as a bride, it must be restricted to the church so that only the church dwells in the new Jerusalem. However, Dr. Valvoud argues against that. He says this, the use of the marriage figure, however, in both the Old and New Testaments is sufficiently frequent 
so that we cannot arbitrarily insist that figures are always used in precisely the same connotation. The subsequent description of the New Jerusalem in this chapter makes plain that saints of all ages are involved and that what we have here is not the church per se, but a city or dwelling place having the freshness and beauty of a bride adorned for marriage to her husband. It's prepared as a bride. Now, you remember in Revelation 19, it talks about the bride making herself ready. But this city is already prepared, which is suggested that the bride has no hand in preparing this city. This city is prepared by God himself for us. Another quote for this time from Garland. This city combines a number of wedding motifs in scripture. It should not be seen as being restricted to the church. It will contain all saints, all believers. The New Testament teaching of the church betrothed to Christ, the Lamb's wife at the marriage, is now joined with the Old Testament passages which indicate that Israel is married to Jehovah and Jerusalem is married to God. The New Jerusalem represents the ultimate consummation of the varied wedding motifs where all the people of God inhabit a city enjoying intimate communion with God face to face. Though the city is itself inanimate, it will be living because it will be inhabited by the saints. The whole teaching of the bride and or the, the wife of Jehovah is quite complex in the scriptures. Now, I'm not going to I'm not going to get into that. We'd be here all day. But most commentators seem to agree with Garland's position that all the saints will dwell in this, not just the church. And there, there are all sorts of different views. Some people don't even think the church is going to be in the New Jerusalem. So they say, oh no, we're the body of Christ, so we won't be in the New Jerusalem because that's for the bride and we're the body. But frankly, if the temple of God and of the Lamb is in the city, it would seem to me to be extraordinary for the church not to be in there. But I just say that really not to confuse you, hopefully, but just to give you some idea of the complexities that there are around this. It's significant, this glorious dwelling place of God is described as a city. And of course, a city is a place with lots and lots and lots of people and with people interacting with each other. So this gives you a picture of the fact that we're not dwelling in isolation. Yes, we'll have our own rooms or mansions, but actually there's going to be a massive amount of interaction. We are going to be the community of the people of God. Loneliness simply won't exist in this city. And of course, something like this can never be the achievement of man, but only a gift from God. Next few verses then. Verses 3 and 4. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So John again hears a loud voice or a great voice. This is the 21st time we have this great voice mentioned, three times seven, of course. It's possible that this is an angel, but most agree it is God. And the great voice is to give emphasis to what's being said, that it is indeed the truth. Now, the first and most important statement about the holy city is that God will tabernacle with men. He wants to draw our attention to this. It's the defining characteristic of this place. And it is the greatest blessing found in all of scripture that God should dwell or fellowship with men. And in this promise, this is the culmination of the scarlet thread of redemption, which runs from Genesis to Revelation. This has been the great purpose of God in Jesus Christ throughout the ages since Adam rebelled. The restoration, the full restoration of fellowship between God and man. And we see pictures of that, don't we, in the tabernacle, the temple, and of course we ourselves are the temple. Right the way through, God wants to dwell with 
man, it was just an astonishing thing when you think about it, that God wants our fellowship. He wants to be around us. He wants to, to put it in the vernacular, hang out with us. It's an extraordinary thing. I like this quote from Spurgeon. This is the greatest glory of heaven and the ultimate restoration of what was lost in the fall. I do not think the glory of Eden lay in its grassy walks or in the boughs bending with luscious fruit, but its glory lay in this, that the Lord God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. Here was Adam's highest privilege that he had companionship with the Most High. That's a lovely quote, isn't it? Now we know the city is holy and all who dwell in it will be holy so that the holy God can dwell with us and that we can see him face to face, just like the angels do now. See God face to face. It's impossible for man in mortal body, sinful body, to, 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 be, to, to be fit for this divine fellowship. And I like, I quite like John MacArthur says this, and it kind of chimes in with what I've kind of thought on many occasions. He says, in fact, to be honest with you, it's sort of comfortable to know God only from a distance. Were we to come too close to him, even though we're his children, in our fallen condition, it would be too frightening for us to bear. And you remember, of course, the reaction of Isaiah, I am undone. And I've thought about that sometimes. I thought, imagine seeing God face to face. We couldn't bear it, I don't think, in our sinful bodies. But we won't be in a sinful body. Then we'll be perfect. We'll be holy as God is holy. We, we, we'd be absolutely fitted for, for this uh, new city. And he himself will minister to our needs. It's going to be our God. He's going to minister to our needs. I'm not sure that I can grasp this. I hope you can, but I don't think I can. And I think as we talk about these things, and it's one of the struggles I've had with this chapter, as we talk about the things of eternity, really, we, we have to admit that this is difficult and we see through a glass darkly. And we're not, God doesn't tell us everything about it. He doesn't, he just gives us enough to whet our appetites. He doesn't reveal everything. He's, it's just enough for us to know it's going to be glorious and no more. God keeps some of his secrets to himself. What is interesting is that the new life is by, it not defined by what is in it, but what by what is not in it. So the Holy Spirit does this he, he defines it by what is not in it rather than by what is in it. So all you need to know, really, he says, is this. There's no more death. There's no more sorrow. There's no more crying. There's no more pain for the form of things have passed away. And that's all you really need to know, the Holy Spirit is saying. And so it's defined by what is not in it. All of these things we are so familiar with, tears, death, sorrow, crying, they, they will all pass away. They all passed away. Satan, sin, sinful nature, death, it's all gone. Everything associated with Satan, the rebellion of man, it's all gone. Everything's gone apart from believers. The rest of it is put away. In fact, Isaiah in chapter 65 says the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Now, this is an interesting verse because uh, or an interesting concept, because some suggest that we won't even remember the things that have happened to us in this life. That, though, raises a lot of questions which I don't really want to attempt to get into. And uh, there are a lot of questions that this chapter raises up. Perhaps it is just that we won't remember the pain. To not remember our, our life means that so much of our personality would be affected. So how could that be? On the other hand, if we did re remember our, our life, we would remember our sins. So would we have the sort of, you see, that would generate possibly the potential for sorrow. So it's a difficult it's more difficult than you think. When you start thinking about it, most of the most Christians, I guess, just kind of waltz through it. Oh, yeah, there'll be no more of these things. They've all gone away. But actually, when you start to really 
think about that and what the implications of that are, you get into some quite deep waters. So having led you to the edge of those waters, I'm going to step back before I fall in and drown. So God wipes away every single tear. Isn't that glorious? All the, all the as, as, sorrowful aspects of life are all done away. And, you know, you can only really appreciate this when you suffer, can't you? As when I was writing this, a dear brother of mine was in terrible pain. He was on the phone. He was only sleeping two hours a night. He had to walk up and down because he was in so much pain. His whole thinking, his whole life was dominated by pain. Unless you've suffered pain like that, you, you cannot really understand the glory of having no more Pain. But for the people in the tribulation, this will really have a particular significance. So this is going to be an absolutely blessed time. And it, we get the fulfillment of the Psalms, you know, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forever. That is going to become a reality. Some suggest that um, God wipes away your tears because you remember uh, your sins or the, the fact that your works got burnt up or the fact that your loved ones are not in heaven but then God comforts you but I, I struggle with that concept as well I think it means that there's nothing whatsoever to cry about and this is because the former things have passed away there just won't be anything troubling our serenity when we're there nothing at all the former things have passed away. I love this. This is a very powerful phrase. You see, one of the most frequently asked questions is, what are we going to do in heaven? And this bothers a lot more people than you might think. I confess it troubles me at times because, and I, I confess my sins, Lord, the thought of sitting on a cloud playing a harp all day for eternity, I have to confess, does not fill me with unalloyed joy. But you see, we won't be bored. It's impossible we'll be bored because boredom belongs to this creation and that will have passed away. So if you're worried about it, and believe me, there are a lot more people than you think that are worried about that. It will have passed away. There won't be anything like boredom in heaven. The Bible only gives hints as to the fact that we will be occupied. It doesn't say what with really we all obviously there'll be praise and worship and adoration certainly but there are hints at other things but they're really only hints just imagine what we're going to talk about in the new jerusalem we won't be able to talk about our arthritis our lumbago our depression how low we feel today what the state of our finances are like who recently offended us in church how we hate our job have we had a second job and did we feel unwell after it etc 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 for all these things have passed away see what the holy spirit is trying to communicate here it will be completely different our conversation is going to be about the lord and his glory and all sorts of exciting things like that I we can't conceive of heaven with our limited knowledge. We just we just can't. But the Holy Spirit gives us enough of a clue so we can say, yeah, it's going to be absolutely glorious. But we can't really talk about it. Remember what Paul said. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. That's 2 Corinthians 12. So you see, he says, no, I can't. I can't tell you what happens. Like. It, uh, we all think that was Paul. He said, I can't, I can't talk about it. It's inexpressible. So there you go. It leaves... <laughs> <laughs> it leaves us just in wonder, doesn't it? So moving on then, verse five, then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, right, for these words are true and faithful. So, behold, it, it, that's a word that's meant to grab our attention. I make all things new, new in character, new in the sense here of recently made. It's a drastic change this is a great work of god a new creation but we'll fit right in because we're already new new creations 2 corinthians 5 17 we'll be changed we'll just be perfect for this and then he says john write 
And that's an aorist imperative in the Greek. In other words, write this down and do it now. I hope you're taking this down, John, in other words. It, because it is part of a revelation of God's special promise for his children. And he doesn't want us to be missing out on this. He wants us to understand these words are true and faithful. You can rely on this. Absolutely. Henry Morris says, when God finally completes the work of making all things new, they'll stay new. The entropy law will be repealed. Nothing will wear out or decay and no one will age or atrophy anymore, which is a great comfort as you get older, isn't it? When you're young and in your 20s, it doesn't bother you so much. But as you get older and you start to ache and creak and all the rest of it, then this is glorious. OK, so he makes all things new. Now, of course, the word says that the earth will never pass away. So that gives us some problems. And some say it means it cannot be annihilated, then recreated. It must instead be reformed. And that's certainly possible. And often to support that argument, they cite scientists who say matter can never be destroyed. Well, the arguments of the scientists carry no weight with me, or not a lot. The, Arguments of the word of God carry more weight. So there's a, there's a sort of discrepancy of thought here, but we know the scripture talks about earth being everlasting. But if it is made new, a new earth, then you could argue, well, the earth, in a sense, is everlasting. It never passes away in the sense that it ultimately ceases to be. So it's an interesting, interesting thought. You might want to think about that. I don't know that it makes a lot of difference to us, really. The word of God is very clear about things we really, really need to know. And on other things, well, it leaves, it leaves us to, to think about it. Maybe God does that deliberately to stir up our thinking about it. So this is the summit of redemption. All things are made new. Some people say, oh, I'd love to go back to the Garden of Eden. No, that's the stage of innocence. This will be much greater than that. Much, much better. The new creation that's in us now will extend beyond us to the whole of the creation, the heavens and the earth. And we have a life within us that is of this new creation. Our new man is destined for this creation. So we actually have that down payment. We actually have the first fruits of this new creation in us. We're carrying it about on the earth. Isn't that extraordinary? So this is a great encouragement for us to live in the new man. And then we experience something of heaven now. What God creates here will be utterly beyond anything we could imagine. What does the word say? I has not seen ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We just can't get our heads around it. What we can do, though, is we can gaze at the beauty of, of this creation, the fallen creation, and think then how much greater the new will be. So God is not lying. He wants us to understand that. And John understands his task, which is to record all that he sees and hears for the benefits of the, the saints. The statements which God makes here concerning the elimination of death, they're difficult for us to understand. So God emphasizes the reliability of what John has told. Moving on then to verses six to eight. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts, he who overcomes shall inherit all things, but I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Well, <clears throat> it's done, completed, it's accomplished. So reminiscent, isn't it, of the words of Jesus on the cross. It is finished. 
because now the legally obtained work of Christ on the cross becomes de facto, it becomes accomplished reality. The last enemy death has been destroyed and redemption in its totality extends throughout God's creation. It will go on forever. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Now, both Father and Son share this title. Truly all things in heaven, in heaven and earth are brought together in Christ. He was before all things, and he's the completion of all things. Most commentators think this is the Son speaking here. Some think it's the Father, but most think it is the Son. See, with the beginning of the eternal state, there is a difference in the divine undertaking of the Son, but not a difference in his divine majesty. Because the work of redemption is now complete, but he still is God, fully God. Now, there's in these verses, there's a deliberate contrast between two sets of people. One set is characterized by thirsting. The other set is characterized really by not thirsting, by rebelling. Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. We always partake of life and that more abundantly. The unbelievers, sadly not. And those who thirst are also the ones who overcome. He who overcome shall inherit all things. Now, I know I've talked about this quite a bit, but it is, a, it is something that does tend to throw a curveball at so many Christians. And sadly, so many uh, commentators try and put into this the sort of, well, you see, you've got to constantly overcome. You can't if you don't overcome then you know you can't get these things so let's just have a look at this just briefly garland says this because redemption is infinitely costly only god could pay the price the price was the death of god in the person of the son of god it was the lamb who redeemed purchased sinners from among men by his blood since the price has already been paid in full no man can add to the finished work. <coughs> Excuse me. To even suggest such a possibility is to devalue the life of the Son of God and declare his purchase inadequate. The joyous result of God's work is that eternal life, which would otherwise be infinitely expensive, is now available simply for the asking. See, what you're saying is, if you're saying, well, if you don't overcome, you've got to overcome to inherit all these things. What essentially you're saying at that point is you have to add to the finished work of Christ. The finished work of Christ is not enough to guarantee you a place in heaven. And that's what they argue, which I believe to be wrong. We only overcome by virtue of being in Christ to suggest that we overcome by our own strength and thus add to the saving work of Christ is to me not sound doctrine. And if this were true, none of us could ever be certain of our salvation at any point, because we know that we all fail. We have an inheritance. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, all things are yours in 1 Corinthians 3, 21. And then in Romans 8, 17, as children of God, believers are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. He did not say all things will become yours, but all things are yours. The deal was done. Anything and everything which the Father has given to the Son is also the possession of the saints. All this courtesy of our salvation. He is our God. We are his sons. Now, verse 8, it gives us some problems this verse outlaying outlines the nature of fallen man this is the nature of those who inhabit at the moment that this is talking about the lake of fire and there is never any chance of them getting into heaven now this what this is not saying is if you commit any of these sins now you can't get to heaven you're you're 
your doom because it would just it, well it would doom every single one of us it's not talking about what we do in this life it, it, at, the, at the moment at this stage in redemption for there is forgiveness if we confess our sins we believe on the lord jesus christ we're cleansed from our sins we are saved but this is the nature of those who inhabit the lake of fire the settled continued nature of those who inhabit the lake of fire I mean, we know that murderers get saved. We know that sorcerers get saved. We have, we have that in the scriptures to tell us that this is so. We know the sexually immoral get saved. So this is not about us. It's like some, someone to try and say that and say, well, when you believe, so you've got to, got to you know, stay away from all these sins. And of course, we should stay away from all these sins. But at the moment, <coughs> different rules apply. We are not at this point. This is describing those in the lake of fire. Most of this list you could nod your head to, I think. The unbelievers, yes, the abominable, etc., etc., etc. It all speaks for itself. But there's, there's a strange one, and that is cowardly. And that's person showing fear in a shameful way. And notice it comes before unbelieving. Cowardly kind of starts off the whole list. And this has often troubled me. And many say, well, this is those who hear the word of truth, but because they don't want to lose their friends or whatever, they refuse to believe. And that's certainly a, a strong possibility, but it's quite strong here to stick it at the front, isn't it? I believe that um, actually, as, as you know, the bulk of Revelation is talking about the, the tribulation. And in the tribulation, those who receive the mark of the beast through fear are lost. That's what the scriptures say. So I wonder if this is a specific reference to the tribulation. Yes, it does have reference perhaps to other ages, but I think in the tribulation, you see, it will be so important that people do not take on the, 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 the number of the beast. And they will take that on because they are cowards. They won't, they won't choose and, and say, yeah, I'm going to live for Jesus. They will choose for the base. So I think this is specific reference to the tribulation. You, you may have different thoughts, and that's that's absolutely fine. I like this quote by Hampton Keithy. Oh, wait a minute. Um, where am I? Just got to pick this up. No. Oh, yeah. I haven't got this on the screen. That's why I'm getting lost a bit. He says this verse should be joyous for us. Those who interpret it to mean that we need to examine our behavior to see if we are saved or if we're still saved have robbed it of its joy and replaced it with work, salvation, gloom. The kingdom will be truly joyful because every, everyone in it will be holy and sinless. So that's really the point that this verse is making out. These, these are the divergent characteristics. Those who thirst, we overcome, we inherit everything. Those who rebel, they inherit the lake of fire. Next few verses then. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit of great and high mountain and show me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Again, what is interesting about this is we've got the new creation being talked about. We've got the new Jerusalem being talked about. And yet one of the angel who comes to John to say, oh, look, come, I'll show you the lamb's wife. I'll show you the new Jerusalem is one of the angels that actually had one of the seven bowls filled with the seven last plague. So what you've got here is a reference back to the tribulation. And that is another little clue to me that the previous verse where it talks about the cowardly has specific relevance to the tribulation. Because there's a connection. You would have thought, wouldn't you, that God would have used an entirely new angel who had nothing to do with the tribulation. But no, he doesn't. The Holy Spirit does a completely different way. He links this back to the tribulation. And I think that's quite an important point. It connects our thinking to to that so he's carried away to a great and high mountain <laughs> yeah 
you'd have to be to on a great high mountain as a vantage point to see this. Of course you would, to get some visual comprehension of the city. And the fact you've seen it from a mountain gives some support that it is going to land on the earth, while others think that the city is going to be suspended above the earth. There are those two thoughts. Some people think the city is going to descend right to the earth. Other people think it's going to kind of hang somewhere above above the earth. It's astonishing, isn't it, when you think about this stuff. It is, of course, amazing. This will outstrip anything the mind of man could conceive. And bear in mind that we might be in this city. Well, I think we almost certainly will be in this city as it descends. Think about that. Yay. John's doing his best to describe it, but how can you describe something which is so beyond our current perception? Imagine Try to describe the internet to someone in the Middle Ages. How would you do that? And even if you, even if you could use the best language, you would still struggle to convey that. And that's just something mundane, if you like. How can you convey what, what the glory is going to be like? It's going to be filled with the glory of God. This city is going to have the glory of God. It's going to be filled with the glory of God. And this takes it beyond our comprehension because we've never seen the glory like this. We see hints of glory here and there. We experience some of the glory, but nothing, nothing remotely like this. Uh, John MacArthur says this, God has displayed his glorious light numerous times. The transfiguration of Jesus was the revealing of the essence of his nature and light. But finally, in the new heaven and the new earth, in the capital city, which is the new Jerusalem, the holy city, his glory revealed as light will be full and limitless and unconfined. So what they saw in the Mount of Transfiguration will be dwarfed even by this. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it? It's going to be absolutely astonishing now the fact that the city is called the bride i'll show you the bride the lamb's wife gives rise to some problems for us all but particularly for some and um there's a couple of quotes on this that give us some idea of uh the issues around this and i just want to read them the first one is dr john falford he says, in keeping with the earlier revelation of 21.2, the holy city, the New Jerusalem, is here characterized as the bride, the lamb's wife. Since the city is not a bride, nor a wife, the truth here represented is that the city, the residence of the saints of eternity future, is to be compared to a bride for beauty and is intimately related to Jesus Christ, the lamb. MacArthur says this, why is it called a city that is a bride? because it draws its character from its occupants, and its occupants are the eternal bride of Christ, now enlarged beyond the church to encompass all the redeemed of all the ages. When you go back into chapter 19, verses 7 to 9, and you talk about the bride there and the marriage supper of the Lamb, of course the bride is the church. We find that very clearly in Ephesians chapter 5. But as you move along in the unfolding of the eschatological plan, the bride enlarges to encompass all the redeemed and that's that's my view i think that is the correct view but people argue about it and i guess they always will until we get there in this chapter it, you get the introduction really uh, to the new jerusalem in verse two but then here you get more details and scripture often does that it often introduces a subject and then goes back to fill in the details and as I said before, some suggest this, this is a picture of Jerusalem in the millennium. But prophecies in the millennium don't accord with this account. And uh, Valvoud again says, the apportionment of the Holy Land and the description of the temple as found in Ezekiel's description of the millennial earth are entirely different. Entirely different. So some more detail. It, its light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Crystal. Now, some of you may remember that we've had this discussion about jasper before, because there is a jasper stone uh, now, but it's not. It's not clear like crystal. And because of the way of, of the word in Greek, many people think that that is actually referring to a diamond. It gets the arguments get quite complex, and there really isn't time to go into that. But it would certainly seem to be 
that a diamond would fit the bill here, or something like a diamond would fit the bill here, uh, rather more than something like the present Jasper stone that we know. Here, the light shines through. Diamonds are amazing. They really sparkle, don't they? You know, they glisten and glint in the light. But this, this is going to have light coming from inside of it. It's going to be quite astonishing. It shines with an eternal light. Now, um, John says her light was like a most precious stone. And he uses this word quite a lot, like. And that tells us that we're not meant to perceive this as being literally we perceive it as it this is what it looks like this is what it looks like so he's trying to convey the heavenly vision in earthly terms so that we can understand it so that's that's what he's saying in the same way if you describe the internet to middle age the people living in the middle ages you'd have to say something like well it's like so, you know, because you, you've got to you've got to encode it in language that they understand. More details about this amazing city. Verse 12. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south and three gates on the west. That's very interesting. Something that we shouldn't take this description of the city to be literal, that it's all meant to be symbolic. And that's nothing new. They've done that with most of the book of Revelation anyway. However, the details that we're going to get into clearly show that this city is to be understood as being literal. The Greek text has it had a wall great and high. The city will be secure. That's the message. But obviously, the begs the question is, if all the enemies are gone, why does it need a war? And that's an interesting question. The fact is, it doesn't really need a war for security, for God is in it. God's in it. And there are no enemies that can get near him. We know it has 12 gates, and we know that those gates will never close, and each gate has an angel. The wall emphasizes, it speaks of the spiritual truth that no one can be there except the ones who should be there. In other words, you can't get into this by some other way. You just can't. You can only be there if you're authorized to be there. Here, unlike the Garden of Eden, there can be no invasion and no temptation. And maybe this is why some commentators come to the conclusion, conclusion that the, the talk of the city is not literal because of this issue with the wall. And, uh, you know, why do you need a wall if, you, if God dwells there? So they say, well, it's obviously symbolic. And the wall symbolizes our security, which it does. But there's one major flaw in that approach, and that is the angel actually measures the wall. It's great and high. Now we do get some measurements, we'll have a look in a minute. We know the length of the wall and there's another measurement, but we don't know for certain that that measurement refers to the height. He says it's great high wall and it could be the height, but it could also be the width. But the fact that it has a wall with dimensions shows that this is the place that is meant to be taken literally. Nothing defiling will ever get into this city. So there are 12 gates, and on them is written the name of the 12 tribes of Israel. These are the literal physical descendants of Jacob. So why, if Israel was replaced by the church, should we get this specific mention of the 12 tribes? And then by contrast later, we get the name of the 12 apostles, who were, of course, Jewish, and that is to clearly distinguish, it seems to me, and many others, between the church age and the age, if I may call it so, of Israel. Replacement theology has no grounds in scripture. Let me just quote Garland. Even though the 12 apostles were all Jewish and therefore physical descendants of Jacob, their names are distinguished from the 12 tribes. 
This reflects the reality that the church did not exist prior to the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit first began his baptizing work, forming the body of Christ. Although the apostles are all Jewish and will rule over the 12 tribes, their greater affinity is as members of the church. And another quote from Valvoud, it is noteworthy, however, that not only are the 12 apostles represented, but also the 12 tribes of Israel. This should settle beyond any question the matter of the inclusion of Old Testament saints. It apparently is the divine intent to represent to the reader that the new Jerusalem will have among its citizens, not only the church or saints of the present age, but also Israel or saints of other ages, whether in the Old Testament or in the tribulation period. And Hebrews 12, suggests uh, but you've come to mount zion to the heavenly jerusalem the city of the living god you've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven you've come to judge god sorry the judge of all men to the spirits of righteous men made perfect it this is much more suggestive that all the people of god will dwell in this heavenly jerusalem that i think is the conclusion that one should draw from these scriptures, but it's argued about, I just about everything else. Moving on then. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 140 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. See, it doesn't tell us he measures the height of the wall. It just says he measured the wall. Could well be the height, but it could well be the width as well. Now, you'll notice as we read through this list, um, you can't escape as well as and as we go on through the chapter you can't es escape noticing the frequency of the number 12 12 gates 12 tribes 12 angels 12 foundation stone 12 apostles 12 poor pearls a wall that's 144 cubits which, which is 12 by 12 of course the height width and length is 12,000 stadia uh stadia is better than furlongs really so um you know Again, that's 12, and then later on we get 12 kinds of fruit, etc. So 12 appears all the way through. We've already talked about the significance of the names of the 12 tribes of Israel and the apostles. Now, note the use of the measuring reed. This is a, this is a physical measure. This is a physical measure, and it's described as um, the measure of a man that is of an angel. In other words, this measurement can be related to uh, physical distinctives that men or mankind can understand it, it's a it's a it's a it's a measure that relates to men but it's actually the angel that's measuring it so that's why it says that is of an angel but the point is it's literal this is a dimension that exists in space time as it were in our own time so yeah it's literal that's why this this city is not symbolic and this is meant to really convey that to us okay it's not symbolic city so the holy spirit anticipated what would be said oh it's all symbolic and put this in so that we know no it's not the city is laid out as a square its length breadth and height are equal so the base of it is a square i'm going to come on to the height in a moment or two now you see if we go to ezekiel 48 15 he says this is talking about the millennial temple the remaining area 5,000 cubits wide 25,000 cubits long will be for the common use of the city for houses of a pasture land the city will be in the center of it and we'll have these measurements, the north side 4,500 cubits, the south 4,500 cubits, the east 4,500 cubits, and the west side 4,500 cubits. It's the city itself is a square. And the same pattern is used in the tabernacle in the wilderness. 
Well, all that I can check out, the Holy of Holies was a perfect cube. And Solomon's temple, 1 Kings 6, 19, he prepared the inner sanctuary within the temple to set the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord there. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 wide and 20 high. He overlaid the inside with pure gold and he also overlaid the altar of cedar. So we have historically the holy place, the sanctuary, the city is laid out as a square and we know that the temple was the, the dinner sanctuary was a cube now that's quite important because we've got to think about this you see because a lot of people say well the city it's square obviously the base is square its length and breadth are equal and its height is equal so that leads you to essentially two possibilities really one is that the city is in the shape of a pyramid which would certainly give the height gives you the height the same as the the, the dimensions of the base. The other is that it's a perfect cube. I suppose you could argue there could be something in between, but really those are your choices. It's, it's really something of those two. Now the dimensions of this city are enormous to say the least, especially if it's cuboid. The dimensions of each side of the base are 12,000 stadia or furlongs. And most settle on this being about 1,500 miles. Uh, the NASV actually puts that in the translation. I don't think they should really. I think the NIV is better here, renders it stadia. And depending on what value you allocate to stadia, uh, Henry Morris takes the stadia as 600 Greek feet or approximately 607 English feet, which gives you a dimension of 1,380 miles, but it's generally rendered 1,500 miles. Now, if this cube is 1,500 miles long and 1,500 miles wide and 1,500 miles high, here are a few little facts that will help you realise just how big this is. 1,500 miles is the distance that is approximately that from the US border with Canada to the US border with Mexico. It would give the base of the city, the base of the city, a floor area which would be equivalent to 63% of that of the 48 contiguous states of the USA, the lower 48 they call them, so it cuts out Alaska and Hawaii and that sort of stuff. But of course, as well as that, it's the same height. And I've just got a couple of slides to show you this. They're a bit twee and you have to forgive me. I did have a look, I tried to find something really smart, but this was about the best that I could get and it just gives you some idea if the city's a cube check it out and there's there's north america and there's the cube that is roughly meant to represent the dimensions there it is again <laughs> it's extraordinary isn't it this is this is how big that city is monty mills in his exegetical study of revelation says this this city would only need 102 levels to equal the surface area of the earth, i.e. the combined areas of the oceans and the land masses. And 102 levels means that each level would be 70,000 feet high which is more than jet planes fly at the moment. So the first, imagine that, the first level of the city, imagine you walked into the city, first level, it's 1,500 miles square, and you look it up and it's 70,000 feet high. So in other words, jet planes could fly around and that's just the first of 102 levels. So these one, the hypothetical 102 levels would have a combined area 300, 40% larger than the total land area, deserts and vast frozen wastes included, of the present Earth. The point of all this is to emphasize that the city that God describes is actually many times more commodious than the Earth that we know. You see, if each story were 12 feet high, which is more normal to us as human beings, and most would think that's quite a high ceiling, it would contain 600 thousand levels or floors 
even at 24 feet, it's 300,000 floors. Imagine going into a hotel with 300,000 floors and each floor is 2,250,000 square miles. That, my dear friends, is a lot of rooms. Henry Morris did some calculations and they're just a stab in the dark, really. He calculated that if 20 billion people uh, come to Christ through our, all the, the generations of those that should live in this city and will live in this huge cube-shaped city, then each redeemed person will inherit about one cubic mile of space within it. <laughs> it's astonishing, isn't it? Cubic mile. So when the Lord said he was preparing a mansion for us, he wasn't kidding. It's an interesting thought. Of course, if the city is uh, in the shape of a pyramid, then obviously the, the, that is cut down uh, considerably. I haven't bothered to do the, uh, the geometric uh, mathematics on that because my maths are absolutely hopeless, but I, it would cut it down quite a lot. I, I would have thought, is it 50% it would cut it down? The mathematicians of Montreal can fight that out. Of course, the wall isn't very impressive um, by comparison. It's just 72 yards. Uh, that's 144 cubits. Um, so it's 72 yards by human measurement. So if that's the height, it's nothing compared to the height of the city. It's just really, really dinky. You know, this would be like a small garden wall. It's just, you know, well, in comparison, I mean. So it didn't tell us the height. Anyway, moving on. The construction of its wall was of jasper and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates of twelve pearls, each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. I don't know how we can possibly imagine this, really. You do your best. <coughs> One does one's best, but really, you know, the whole city is going to be full of light. It's just going to be gleaming with light. It's going to be absolutely astonishing. Now, both Mal MacArthur and Valvoud suggest that the, the foundation stones of the wall um, are layered one upon another. So Jasper or diamond, as many think, being the bottom, and then they, it, it, it goes up. But it could be, I guess, that they could be spaced around the city. After all, there are, there are 12 gates, 12 foundations. Uh, would these be foundations of the gates at that point? I really don't, uh, I really don't know. Um, you know, I think that's just got to be open to discussions. Interestingly, these stones were all represented on the high priest's breastplate. Does God know from the beginning, from the end? Oh, yes, he most certainly does. The gates that are pearl, this is like the pearly gates, as everyone wants to uh, to talk about, don't they? The famous pearly gates where you're greeted by St. Peter. Of course, you'd not. You'd be greeted by an angel, but there we are. Many suggest, and I think it's a great suggestion, that these gates are representative of the Gentiles who were unclean, but are now cleansed, because evidently um, it's the oyster, isn't it, that makes pearls? Is it the oyster? Yes, I think it is. Anyway, it's it's an unclean thing. So in other words, this is the, 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 the unclean, cleansed, grafted in, if you like. We're the pearl of great price. But this description both represents, therefore, the Jews and the Gentiles, because the Gentiles are represented in the pearls, the Jews are represented in the foundation stones being the same as on the high priest's breastplate. So, yeah, we're both, we're both there. This will be astonishing. I like what MacArthur says about this. He says, now I know God loves beauty, don't you? I know that because I can see flashes of that brilliance in the gems that I can see and flashes of his love for colour in a rainbow and in the million, myriad colours that ring the world and the beauty of flowers and all the rest. And when God is really turned loose, beauty is going to emanate everywhere. Blazing, unbelievable, incomparable beauty. 
this is going to be glorious. It's going to be filled with light and beauty. It is going to be spectacular. There's not really much more you can say about this, really, because you just have to try and imagine it. And I'm not sure we could really do that. And we could kind of try and speculate about it. But I think that would be wrong. See, we know that even in this fallen world, there's some inexpressible beauty in it. And if you look, if you've ever looked at the, the pictures that the Hubble Space Telescope takes of galaxies and, <clears throat> and um, nebula and stuff like that, it's the most extraordinary beauty everywhere throughout creation is beauty. And this is fallen. Imagine what the new creation is going to be like. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. Hallelujah. But I saw no temple in it, verse 22, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Now, what arrests John's attention here is it has no temple completely in contrast to everything that he's known. Perhaps he looked for one and couldn't find it, or perhaps he was told there wasn't one. I don't know. There is no need for the temple because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And now there is perfect communion between God and ourselves. There is no need for a temple. The phrase also tells us something important, and that is that God the Father and the Lord Jesus are both equally God. There is no distinction. For I saw no temple, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, which settles once and for all that the Son of God is God. It's not a lesser creation. The, the, oh, the Lord God Almighty, that's to stress his sovereign power and uh, might and providence. And the Lamb is used of Jesus to stress that we're there because of the work of the Lamb. So this city has no need of external light for the glory of God is its light. In the Holy of Holies, there was no light. And like the holy place, the glory of God was light. The holy place had a lampstand, but in the, in the most holy place, only God lit it up. And here God is the light. You'll never be able to turn a light off here you'll never be able to turn the lights out and you'll never need any sleep but i won't go into that just yet i want to talk about that later on there's a verse in isaiah 24 23 that says it talks of the sun being ashamed isn't that wonderful some commentators say because there are verses which say that the sun and moon will endure there must be a sun and a moon and it this these scriptures, these scriptures don't rule that out. It just says the city had no need of the sun or of the moon. It doesn't say that there isn't a sun or a moon. See, just the, the moon is described as lasting forever. Psalm 89, 35. Once for all I've sworn by my holiness, and I will not lie to David, that his line will continue forever, and his throne endure before me like the sun. It will be established forever like the moon, the faithful witness in the sky. Others say, no, no, this is entirely new creation, so therefore that doesn't apply. That the promises to the Davidic line, once Israel's promises have been fulfilled, is, and the Lamb's Davidic throne is merged with the Father's throne, that these will no longer apply. I think, you know, uh, me, I, I like the fact that I think the sun and moon will be there, but you know, we don't absolutely know, I think. Um, but that would be my leaning. I, I try and keep an open mind. Um, there, as I say, the new Jerusalem being full of light and there being a sun and moon are not mutually exclusive. One commentator says that we, you might need the sun and the moon to shine where the, where the city doesn't shine. Um, he says this, neither the sun nor the moon will ever really be destroyed, of course, since God has promised that they, as well as all the starry heavens, will endure forever. It is just that their light is no longer needed to illumine the holy city, for the city itself radiates light to all the surrounding regions. However, the sun and moon will continue to serve their present functions with respect to the nether regions of the earth, serving there as lights by day and night, respectively. So 
you know, that's certainly an interesting possibility, isn't it? Okay, last few verses now. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall be no, by no means enter into it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. See how this principle keeps getting restated. Nothing unclean is ever going to enter this. That God wants us to clearly, clearly understand that. He really does. Um, the scripture talks of the nations and kings. And now this gives rise to all sorts of ideas and speculations. And broadly speaking, there are two main views amongst literal commentators, those who take the Bible literally. Those who don't take the Bible literally, don't take this literally, of course, can make up anything they like and make up fairy stories and often do. And the first view is that this is simply speaking of all those who have believed throughout the earth's history, Jews, Gentiles, and all stratas of believers, all will have access to the new Jerusalem. And so, you know, there'll be kings and the nations, as it were. The other view is that people who are alive at the end of the millennium are preserved and gone to populate the new earth. Let me put up two quotes, which kind of exemplify the different positions. Firstly, MacArthur. You say, well, then explain to me how the nations got there and the kings got there. Well, that's not really that difficult. Nations is, nations is the word ethne, and all it means is the peoples. It can be translated nations. Most often, do you know how it's translated in the New Testament? Most often it's translated by the word, what? Well, Gentiles. It's the same word. It can be translated peoples. That's really all it means. In the broadest sense, all the peoples from every tongue and tribe and nation and the world will all be walking in its light. In fact, what he's really saying here is this is not going to be limited to one group. This is going to be this is going to be the eternal capital where everybody is welcome. There will be no more divisions as we know them. All the nations shall walk by its light. And then you get this. This is a, this is Garland, and he's citing a fellow by the name of uh, Thomas, who, by the way, cross references both Covet and Says. And let me just quote this. This is an issue on which the text of Revelation is silent, but there is one theory which seems to satisfy the available criteria best. This opinion holds that the nations are composed of safe people who survive the millennial kingdom without dying and without joining Satan's rebellion and who undergo some sort of transformation that suits them for life in the eternal state. They will be like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden prior to the fall. They will be unresurrected human beings who will inhabit the new earth. And that's paradise, paradise restored throughout eternity. So a few even go so far as to say God might create new peoples. And of course, I guess that you could argue that God can do anything he wants. But the thought of a new hum, human race in many ways creates more questions that it, than it answers. Um, Bringing the glory and honor of the nations into it? Well, does it fit better with the, the explanation that the millennial nations will have been preserved to re inhabit the earth? You judge. I don't think we know. There's an interesting quote here from, from uh, Says, and this, this really gets your brain juices going. I hold it to be a necessary and integral part of the scriptural doctrine of human redemption that our race as a self-multiplying order of beings will never cease either to exist or to possess the earth. Ransom nations in the flesh are therefore among the occupants of the new earth and the blessed and happy dwellers in it as Adam and Eve dwelt in paradise. Now that is absolutely fascinating, you see, and you really have to think about this. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them to be self-multiplying order beings, unlike the angels, which as far as we know, were never self-multiplying order beings. So he's arguing there that to fulfill total human redemption, there must always be uh, self-multiplying order of beings. Now, of course, that means, 
you're talking about sex, you're talking about multiplication, you're talking about physical conjoining. It raises a whole bunch of questions, doesn't it? You know, it raises a, you know, it really is, um, well, I don't like to say can of worms, but really I'm not quite sure what the phrase to, to put on that. We just, we just don't know. I, I haven't yet come across any scriptural evidence that absolutely decides it one way or the other. I, I like what MacArthur says. I think that makes a lot of sense. But part of me thinks, yeah, that there's some <coughs> possibilities here that would make eternity really interesting. But where you get sex, you get do you, would you get distortion of sex? You know, there's all, it, it's, it really is, it, theologically, it's a real can of worms. And I was tempted not to go there. And I thought, no, you need to understand that. You need to know that. She might come across somebody who plumps one way or the other, really is firm on that. But actually, I, I don't think we can know. There's an enormous amount about what is coming that we don't know. What we don't know is far more, far, far more than, than that which we do know. What we do know is that this city will be holy, it'll be pure, it'll have light bursting out of it, its gates will never be shut or locked, there's no night there, you won't need any sleep, imagine that, hallelujah. We shall be there, life will be nothing at all like we know it now. One commentator says this, I'm going to finish in a moment, the quality of our future life in the eternal city is such that it makes even the best of this life seem as only darkness. What God has prepared for us will be beyond our imagination. It will be pleasure forevermore. We will not age, get tired, get sick, ever worry about anything ever again. We will need no rest. And the fact that the gates are open suggests we will come and go as we please. Doing what? Well, that's not revealed. Hallelujah. But I'm sure it will be great. Now, when we come back for the next session, we're still going to be talking at least to start with about the New Jerusalem. So I'll say more then. God bless you. And uh, yeah, that's the first session finished. Okay. Cool. Thanks, John. So um, I guess we've got uh, sort of five past 11 or... What do you think, John? We're 10 to now. Yeah, five past 11. Yeah, five past. Aim, yeah. aim for five past. The, 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 next, the next session won't be as long. Okay. So okay. We'll, we'll, a bit shorter. Yeah. we'll make sure everyone's back first. Brilliant. That's wow. Great, John. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks. See Brilliant. you when you get back. Yeah, thank you, John. Yeah. 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 You're going to stop. You're going to stop recording then. Uh, oh. Oh, yeah. And I'll start again. Is that right? Yes, please. That's what we did last time, isn't it?